Yeah, thanks all. Thanks, Ross. No worries. Uh, welcome, everybody, again. Um, been a long time since we spoke last, I guess, on Friday. But uh, as James mentioned, yeah, we're, we're just swapped this week's. So we brought Fridays forward. It's the BIM execution plan we're going to, to talk about today and the intro to BIM, which would include ISO 19650 and some standards will be moved to Friday. Mary uh, will be given that um, presentation. Uh, you'll get an update in your in your calendar uh, sometime this week, I guess, James or Ruth, uh, if, if you're there. Um, just so everybody has the the link, uh, the time might change. Also, um, it might be moved to lunchtime, uh, one o'clock on Friday. But we'll come back with that anyway. But um, yes, let's just jump straight into it. And uh, as James mentioned, uh, if you have any questions, stick them in the chat, and I'll try and get through this um, as quick as we can, so we can have a dialogue uh, towards the end, similar to last week. It's good to get people involved in the conversation. Uh, with questions or queries or your experiences also is, is something we're interested in hearing. Uh, how are you working today and, and, and what's your experience so far on your projects with your clients, with the other stakeholder groups, et cetera, et cetera. But today is the BIM execution plan and um, we're going to kind of walk through what the BIM execution plan is, where it sits in terms of information hierarchy, how we as quantity surveyors use the BIM execution plan. And then we look at some information relating to the BIM execution plan that is important to us uh, as quantity surveyors and cost managers, uh, stuff like information and uh, elements uh, like, like that. Information is key to us, of course, as QSs. Quick introduction again. Yeah, my name is Ross Griffin, uh, founder of, of a digital QS practice called Cosmos. We're based in Copenhagen and Limerick for any of our Limerick colleagues down here and the Fifth Dimension, which is our SaaS company. Um, I won't waste too much more time on that. So let's just jump straight into the BIM execution plan. Um, as an introduction, I guess, the BIM execution plan and, and today's presentation, unlike Friday's, it's quite wordy today. Um, unfortunately, there's not many visuals that can explain the BIM execution plan. We do have some some graphical tables and stuff, uh, but it's it's quite wordy. So so bear with us and we'll try and get through it through it today. But the BIM execution plan uh, is a key and dynamic document. Um, it basically sets the foundation for how the project should deliver digital information. Um, how we structure data and what requirements are around that from the client's perspective. It's a project-based document and it will be reflective of what is in the client's EIR, employer or exchange information requirements. The EIR is kind of a macro document that would sit with the employer that should be uh, defining the requirements on a very high level. The BIM execution plan then would sit underneath that, take those requirements and develop them further for the for the project itself. Um, and what's important, of course, is define the scope, uh, the uses, process flows, roles and responsibilities. All of this needs to be defined in relation to um, data management, data exchange, who st what stakeholders uh, will be on the project through the project life cycle, and and how that information will be will be used. It's the entire framework basically for the implementation of building information modeling on a project. Um, and I will caveat something here. There's no defined implement, implementation methods. Um, it's kind of project by project basis. There is standards out there. If you go on to the RAI, uh, SCSI, you, you'll find standards <clears throat> relating to BIM execution plans. Um, and I think a number of years ago, we, we also have a document which you'll find on the SCSI's website, which is BIM implementation for quantity surveyors, kind of a step-by-step -step process. So if you haven't already had an opportunity to have a look at that, I think uh, it's worth it's worth a read. It goes into an awful lot more granularity, I would say. One of the graphs that we are able to produce today is, is this information requirements and the, and, and the different levels within organizations that, that uh, these requirements sit. You can see the BIM execution plan on the bottom middle there after the EIR exchange information requirements or employers information requirements. Um, but organizations will have their own information requirements, especially for clients uh, or employers that are multi-asset owners. We would expect all government departments, if you like, the OPW, et cetera, all the councils 
should have their organization level requirements. The asset level requirements is based around the content within the building. And, and of course, it, it all feeds through to the BIM execution plan, which is what you would use on your project delivering a certain project. And again, this stuff is 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 important that we, as we develop, as we grow, and as we learn on our projects, we're feeding that information back into uh, the overall and overarching documentation because it's an evolution here as we work through the projects and as teams become, uh, I guess, more experienced when it comes to information management. Uh, we'll be learning as the projects go, so we'll need to feed those learnings back up into the organizational information into the asset information and 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 subsequently down to future projects and um, i think that's a very important important statement the bep is an is a is an open document and it it will evolve on the project and it will evolve across projects especially for multi asset owners i must say um and this this diagram again defines it basically as we go through the project life cycle we need to feed information back into the overall arching document. So what happens on the project goes back into the employer's uh, or exchange information requirements and the asset requirements as well from the users, from the facility managers uh, while managing and operating on the buildings for future buildings. And we're trying to, as I mentioned last week, we're trying to change the linear process that we view construction into a more circular process not circular when it comes to sustainability yet, but circular when it comes to information, feeding our our experiences and feeding that information back into the beginning of the next projects, into the overall arching documentation that that uh, specifies how we deliver projects for for the employer for our clients. Um, and the BIM execution plan. Every stakeholder group within the project lifecycle will have different deliverables, requirements and responsibilities and needs. And it's important to make sure that we we understand where and who manages this information and has responsibility across the project lifecycle. Um, you can see here, we it, it's kind of split between the employer's or client's documents versus the supplier's documents, like the contractor, architect, engineer, et cetera. The, the employer will define what their needs are as an overall uh, strategy for their business um, and then define it on the project, as we mentioned before, with the BIM execution plan, so that the suppliers, be it the consultants or the contractor or supply chain, can deliver within those requirements for the project. Um, and so it's important to, 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 to really understand that. And the BIM execution plans, they differ uh, dramatically from project to project, um, depending on who uh, is advising the client and I would say how experienced the client is um, in relation to this. Um, I think we're we're moving ahead now in Ireland, um, especially hopefully next year when the public requirements will come. Um, but we sh we should all be working on projects where there is a BIM execution plan today. Uh, I would be surprised if 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 we don't have a BIM execution plan on our projects today because we're managing data at the end of the day. Um. So I guess the purpose of the benefits of a BIM execution plan, it's like any contract, you know, um, it's an agreement uh, that all parties will sign up to. Um, the BIM execution plan is, it is important to get that agreed on the project as early as possible. From day one, we, we begin to create information. So it is important that we have somewhat of a BIM execution plan, even if it's a skeleton uh, at the very beginning. But the BIM execution plan will evolve and as new stakeholders come onto the project, um, it will be important if you already have got that information in the in the BIM execution plan for the stakeholders, like the contractor, the quantity surveyor, um, the sustainability specialist. If it's in the BIM execution plan, great. If it's not, it will need to be added as those stakeholders come on board. And they will also need to voice their opinion on the BIM execution plan when they are on board. But the benefits, it should improve communication. It will absolutely improve collaboration. Um, as we mentioned the last day, uh, we believe now it's the architect and engineer who, who quantifies purely because they designed the geometry within the 3D model. The collaboration between quantity surveyor and design teams only increases now because we become the kind of managing the information in terms of quality, but also the processing of that information. Over time, 
it will save time. Um, initially, I think that there's going to be, it's going to slow things down slightly because we're going to need to educate ourselves on the project, but the efficiencies that it will create will, will create an awful lot of uh, time saving during that pre-construction as well as the construction. Sharing of data, of course, because we could become data focused now um, and then stronger execution because the quality of information is better. The information that the that the market is receiving is better quality, meaning that the the level of change uh, theoretically should come down. Um, and of course, pre appointment, uh, we talked a little bit about ISO 19650. That should have been presented today, but we'll take that on Friday. So for anybody uh, looking to to know a little bit more about the standards uh, available, I think. Uh, Friday is a good a good day for uh, to join. Uh, I think uh, ICMS and, and and some other LCA requirements will also be discussed. Um, and this pre appointment really is to to look at uh, how and where the project you want to go, what what association or what stakeholders will be will be on that project, and how you expect to deliver it. Um, and and the BIM execution plan, like a contract, forms the basis for this. If there ever is a a discussion it's it's easy to go back and reflect on what was agreed originally i think that's one of our big challenges today on projects is that not all stakeholder groups have have their input into the bim execution plan meaning that when they do come on board like the qs for example and everybody in this in this call um we're not getting the information that we need uh and not in the quality level that we need it um purely because we're we're not getting involved in the conversation at the beginning so quite important to to um to get into that conversation. And of course, these pre-appointments are, are, are important. And ISO 19650 uh, uh, itemizes out what, what requirements are there, but we'll dig into more of that uh, later this week. I won't spend too much time on it now. Um, and the content of the pre-appointment, details of individuals undertaking the information function, like who is going to be managing the information and at what stages along the project life cycle. It will change from stakeholder to stakeholder depending on uh, the project and the project type. Um, so it's important to understand that from the from the beginning. Um, and the delivery of information. How are we going to deliver information? Um, is that common data environments? What type of platforms and softwares we'll be using? Is it IFC when when communicating? Is it rivet format? What really are we talking about here on on, on our on our project? Um, and the responsibility matrix, we dig into this information further down in our presentation, but it becomes important to understand which stakeholder does what and when and what type of information is expected from the stakeholders. So uh, we have some examples later on. And that document I mentioned with the SCSI uh, BIM for quantity surveyors, it details out quite a bit in that document. So I would, I would suggest uh, downloading it and having a read through. Yes, and of course, uh, the software is the hardware, the IT infrastructure. What exactly are we going to be using on the projects? Is it Qubit? Is it Costex? Uh, is it Celebri from a, a QS perspective? Is it Bluebeam uh, 2D measurement? All of this uh, needs to be identified uh, and discussed early on. So it becomes clear for everybody what softwares are being used. Um, Yes, and the delivery team, of course, who's going to be doing what um, along the project life cycle. And here is just a, an example of what a, a structure uh, from a BIM execu execution plan could look like. As I mentioned before, there's many different standards out there. We can we can absolutely download them. Uh, even if you Google it, you, you'll, you'll get a number. Um, but the structure is is one thing. It's the quality of the document is, is the other and, and who's actually delivering it. But that was a quick introduction into a BIM execution plan. And I think now for everybody here, it's more important to understand how this affects us as quantity surveyors um, and how we communicate and discuss with other stakeholder groups uh, along the, the project life cycle. So uh, we're, there's, a, there's many headings under the BIM execution plan. We're only going to look at some of them for now, uh, project information, project goals, organizational roles and staffing, BIM information exchange, collaboration, uh, project deliverables, and quality control. Um, I think the quality control one is very interesting uh, from our perspective as, as QSs. It, 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 will, it will determine uh, whether we can use the quantities or not from, from the models, or it'll determine whether we can use the information from the models uh, or not. But 
let's dig in here to, to that uh, project information. So as we mentioned before, while setting up the project, it's necessary for the BIM coordinator and the quantity surveyor to meet and discuss and to agree a number of things. We, we, we try to itemize out some particular focus areas here uh, from a QS's perspective that become key to, in the BIM execution plan. It, it will affect the result of information processing um, during the project life cycle and the, and the preparation of cost estimates and cost plans and bills of quantities, et cetera. Um, from our perspective, and this is a challenge we come across on every single project, is how many buildings will be uh, within the project material? Uh, is it singular building? Is it multi-buildings? How are we going to split those buildings? Will there be independent models for each building? Will it be one fully federated model for the entire project site? Um, what are the naming conventions for those, those buildings? Because when it comes from a cost perspective and a carbon perspective, we'll need to know uh, and define the information for each building so we understand what the, the capex for each building is and what the LCA impact for each building is. So it's important to have that discussion early on with the, with the design team so that that understanding um, is in the BIM execution plan and clear for everybody uh, before we start any type of modeling. Um, and that's that's a challenge. And it's slightly different from today's world, I guess, from 2D measurement. We can split the buildings ourselves by quantifying manually from the drawings and identifying building one, two, or three. Whereas if we want to use the quality of, of the models, ideally the design team should do that. Some of the softwares will allow you for uh, for locations, meaning that you can extract quantities for particular locations, but ideally it should be part of the the the, the BIM execution plan and the design uh, produced by the architects and engineers, because they should be agreeing this also. Another one is the schedule of areas. You know, how how is the area calculated within the, the model? GFA, is it internal and external? Uh, you know, is it net, is it gross? How, how are they going to, to evaluate that? Always a challenge on the projects. And I'm sure you've all come across in the past issues around around areas, um, and then an agreement on on types of output, whether it's two D or three D. You know, do we have diagrams, schedules, details, uh, external landscaping and finishes, inventory, um, and the file formats associated with this? Is it PDF? Is it DWG? Is it IFC? Is it Rivet? What exactly file for formats do we expect on the project? Um, and finally, the level of information. And we will dig into the level of information um, a little bit later, but it's important to understand what's expected for the different disciplines at the different design stages. Um, an example is you're not going to expect a LOD 350 um, at concept design for ventilation, for example, because it just won't be available. It's an evolution. Design is an evolution. So you can't expect what is not possible. Um, so that needs to be discussed because often it's misunderstood uh, between stakeholders and what's very important for the QS and in terms of pricing might not be as important for the architect or engineer in terms of design. Um, so that regular communication becomes key, but it's better to define it early um, if, if possible. Then we have, there's a kind of a crossover, I guess, with the information that's already been produced traditionally on projects like the time schedule and the contract and 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 the roles and responsibilities, et cetera. But scheduling the dates for submissions is is becomes a, an important agreement. Like when do we expect to get models? When is model and design stop happening? What will the impact of you know revisions uh, be on 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 the project? Um so initially, it's great to, to identify that within the BIM execution plan, but of course, things change. So you need to keep that BIM execution plan up to date, and that happens through regular communication. And then something that is is challenging often, these last few elements, is, is the client deliverables. If the, cl the client and or the employer has, has direct deliverables, how are they modeled? How are they defined within the, within the design uh, information? that needs to be agreed because some of that might not be depending on your role on the project, depending on whether you're, you're as a QS are brought in to support the design team, meaning you're just looking at construction costs or you're brought in for the client employer to look at the entire project capex. Um, it'll, it'll be important to understand what information is of value to you and what is not. And that needs to be um, agreed upon with the design team. 
and how will change be managed within within the models and um, traditionally we would we would cloud drawings and stuff but it's different within the models so we need to understand how how change is going to be managed both from a design and and scope perspective um, and design material supersedes all others you know um often we we have this challenge um when we talk about 3d models and you know intellectual property and a lot of companies are very anxious about giving models out especially to to uh, the market during during procurement and during tender um but if we clearly define what the model is for and and what documentation hierarchy is there then from our perspective and, and what we would advise our clients is model is just for information only um you're it's still contractually required to 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 deliver drawings and specifications etc but that should be defined um so everybody's clear on that and last but, last but not least is the document naming uh convention and iso 19650 the irish uh uh, uh document will define that for us here we we just follow that, but it needs to be agreed with the client as well and be part of the BIM execution plan. Again, as I say today, it's a little wordy, um, such is the way with the, with the, this type of presentation, I guess. And then kind of BIM use types and, and subtypes. Um, we often come across challenges uh, with the design team uh, in terms of how they name and, and exactly what information is of value to us uh, as, as quantity surveyors when processing information and what information is of value to the designers when designing, it, it often differs. Um, so we try to define clearly, we'll show you some matrix uh, later, we try to define clearly what information is of value and at what stages in the project life cycle is that information of value. Um, and so that means that we're getting better quality. So the effort put in from the design team is, hap is, is, is happening once because this is how we've defined the structure as opposed to challenges later on uh, when we take the models as quantity surveyors and suddenly we realize that, you know, the engineer uh, for, for the superstructure or construction has done differently to the architect, has done it differently to, to the other engineers. And in, the processing of information becomes very, very difficult in that sense. Um, so the defining this information at the early stages it sets the, 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 I guess, the foundation uh, of how we're going to work. Now, as I mentioned before, the BIM execution plan is a dynamic document. It can always change, especially if it is adding benefit and quality or value to the project. Then it should absolutely be considered uh, changing whatever structure you have in place there, or whatever information that you have previously agreed upon. And um, yeah, and so like the BIM, BIM uses, I guess, models 3D and the content. All of this we have looked at a, a few minutes ago. That that how do you differ or defer to different building types, clear identification uh, independently of the model, of the number of models. Um, as we mentioned, this is, is super important, especially if you need to break down uh, quantities from foundations across three or four building types, uh, because you would like to price your each building separately. Um, and some of the uh, quality assurance that we do is making sure that uh, we have the correct object categories identified in the BIM execution plan, but more importantly, we have the correct object categories identified in the models when they're received. Um, are there type naming for the for 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 objects, uh, especially uh, unique objects within the within the models? What are these type names? What are we going to use? Uh, all needs to be discussed with the design teams. They'll have their own standards anyway. Most design teams do at this stage. All we're doing is making sure we understand what their what those standards are, um, and then the unique uh, type ID the classification code, whether it's uniclass or omniclass, or uh, if it is a local uh, classification that you have within your your own country. Uh, Denmark has actually two classifications: one developed by the engineers and one developed by the architects. Surprise, surprise. So unique IDs, it's important. Um, and then are there any duplicate objects? Uh, often you will find when modeling, if, if designers bring in objects from previous projects, often there are some legacy issues with data quality and you'll, get, you'll end up getting duplicate projects, uh, duplicate objects, sorry. Um, and making sure then that uh, it's, it's clear that those objects are, are a challenge and that the design team clean up their design information. Um, so these kind of questions we like to raise with the, um, 
with the designers at the beginning. So they understand that actually this is having an impact on us uh, when processing that in that information. Um, this is an example there, for example, the equipment under mechanical uh, equipment and not under accessories or generic models are unclassified. Often you will see that the designers will, in their haste, trying to get their design complete, the quality of their, their cataloging of their information drops uh, because of that time pressure, and they'll begin to throw uh, elements against generic models are unclassified. If that happens, we can't then um, depending on what software you're using for your for your 5D, whether it's Costex or Qubit, you can't then map those elements. It becomes challenging uh, to, for automation. And so it's important to make sure that uh, when we run these quality checks that uh, that we can have these conversations with the discipline leads for each of the um, for each of the design stakeholders. And then the models that are delivered, that design stage is a compliant with the LOD level that we have all agreed uh, within the BIM execution plan. Often you will see that if there's no one really managing the information uh, and no one processing the information um, pre-construction, that often there's elements of the design that are under-delivered. Uh, so the LOD isn't to the level that agreed. And because no one's processing information, for example, if you're only do 2D measurement and use a QS or not processing the 3D information, then there's no one really checking and there's no one checking on the employers or the client side either. It, it doesn't get checked actually until it goes to market when the contractor begins to look at the models and they realize that the model quality is very poor, which is why a lot of contractors will remodel everything uh, once they take over or once they sign the contract. And we want to be able to get away from that as, as much as we can. Yeah, and then and the last one there, um, does the model contain objects where there's no uh, extract of quantities? This often happens as well. There's elements in the model where you you extract and there's no quantities. Why is that? We need to dig into that with the, with the discipline leads to understand. So getting those processes understood from a QS perspective, and more importantly, from an architecture and engineering perspective, because remember, the design teams don't understand your profession. That's your profession. You need to be now be able to sit with them and talk about their modeling process so you understand, and then your uh, quant quantity process so that they understand. Uh, it helps an awful lot with, with, with them providing good information and following the BIM execution plan. Roles and responsibilities then, we've tried to define ourselves internally, what we believe the, the roles and responsibilities for, for the uh, engineers, architects, QS, et cetera, when it comes to um, information management, just just so it's a little bit more clear, often you'll find is a lot of the roles and responsibilities miss out on the QS's process of data management or information processing. So we like to add those additional elements to the roles and responsibility matrix. There might already be one on the project. This is uh, particularly uh, in relation to the BIM execution plan uh, for the project. And then the export of quantities. Um, and I would say that uh, essentially kind of BIM measurement falls into three, three to four categories. Uh, automated quantity takeoff, as we know, that is the, you've already processed the information at a previous phase. So let's say concept design, you take the, the, the 3D model, you process the foundation quantities in, in Qubit, Costex, Vico, whatever software you're using. If nothing changes in terms of the information string within the 3D model, it means your quantities at the next stage will be automatically updated. Um, and ideally speaking, that's where we want to get to. We want to get to a place where we're processing the information. Derived takeoff, um, I'll use an example, uh, again, as the foundations and the measurement of, for example, formwork that would be derived from the foundation geometry uh, in, in accordance with your measurement rule. Manual takeoff, which we all know, that's, of course, manual takeoff from 2D drawings. Not everything is modeled. Um, I think a number of years ago, we did an analysis on a number of our projects where it was a full digital project. And in relation to the direct building works, there were, we only modeled about 60% of the value uh, of the direct works. Um, so there's 40% that is unmodeled. So that will come from the 2D drawings, diagrams, um, details, et cetera. And then there's uh, other areas of quantifiable uh, scope, not present in the, the graphical material, not present on the drawings of the model, basically coming from the specification and, and, and other areas that need to be somewhat quantified. 
But if we can take the 80-20 rule where 80% of the, the cost is in 20% of the items, if we can automate all that, then uh, I think we're in a, a very good position. And that's where we need to, 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 to get to when, when looking at uh, uh, these large projects. So just to look at the at that agenda, we've covered now four uh, out of the seven uh, elements. Um, and I think we're going to, the last three are, are really particular, but without setting up your project, without building the collaboration and communication with the design teams, uh, the quality of information becomes much more difficult to control. So that early stage engagement is, is, uh, is very important. So let's just jump into the last uh, uh, bunch of slides here, the last three categories. So collaboration, as we mentioned at the very beginning, uh, BIM is driving more collaboration because now we're data sharing. Uh, in the olden days, we were just taking drawings and specs and and what have you. Now, actually, we're we're exchanging information in IFC format, in in DWG or in 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 Revit format. Uh, so that information quality needs to be, uh, I say, qualified from our perspective, but a good quality level based on what we've agreed in the BIM execution plan. So we just have a little warning here: ask for warnings, uh, be aware, and account for design flaws. So where columns are drawn through slabs. So your method of measurement here, this is where NRM and ARM become a huge question for us as QSs because traditionally those documents are prepared uh, from a traditional quantifiable process. So manually measuring means you can you can read what your measurement rule is and 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 then measure from the drawing. Unfortunately, I would say that but the modeling process is not the same as the measurement process. So we need to be sure that when speaking to the design teams, how have they approached the modeling process? And some of the challenges that we have is that we don't have clear defined modeling processes, uh, modeling rules uh, yet. And often you will see that if I use Denmark as the example, they brought out modeling rules as opposed to measurement rules. Um, and use those modeling rules then as their measurement rules. So there's a little collaboration that's going to need to happen over the next number of years between the design teams and the quantity surveyors to make sure that our measurement rules and our modeling rules are quite similar so that we can get even more accurate automation from our quantities. Um, yeah, and so, but I think we'll come back to that. Hopefully, uh, uh, ARM5, when it comes out, will ha have taken that into account. Uh, but let's see in the new year, I guess. Um, yeah, and where elements are modeled to a different level of detail than other elements in the same model, this becomes a challenge. So if we're getting an LOD 100 at a, at, a, at a detailed design stage and we're expecting an LOD 350, we need to absolutely make sure that we understand what we're looking at and that the design teams understand what is our what is expected from us? If if you're looking for that level of detail, so that you can uh, you can measure in accordance with your measuring rules, and it's not there, then we have a challenge. And where elements of the project belong to a specific discipline are modelled under the model of a different discipline. What do I mean by that? Um, so, if if the design if the architects are are designing the louvers, for example, but the louvers are are, are designed under the under the structural engineer's design for whatever reason, we need to understand that and make and make sure that um, that is clear when communicating across disciplines. Um, and where manual calculations differ from the information presented in the graphical documentation. So why are we getting, if you were to do spot checks on, for example, total ceiling areas within the building and it's 40, 50% above what you're getting from the model or vice versa, those quick checks will allow for additional quality assurance. So um, having that communication with the design team allows us uh, to be able to, um, to become more accurate in the information. And all of this, of course, is feeding off that foundation from the BIM execution plan. So we like to stick these checks into the appendices of the BIM execution plan so that when we're on the project, we can open up this kind of this help section and uh, use that for quality assurance uh, of the information. As we mentioned before, defining and understanding what level of information and what level of detail we expect to get at the different design stages is key for us to be able to communicate with the design team. Like there's 
I guess there's no point getting upset if if you're at conceptual design and you're expecting a full mechanical uh, design uh, information in the model. That's not just going to happen. Um, it won't come till later because of the evolution of design process. But understanding where you can take the information at the different design stages because you know the level of detail versus where you can't get the information and you need to derive it or you need to manually measure it. That's fundamental to your your process and your plan as the quantity surveyor. So having this LOD or level of detail matrix uh, allows us to have a clear understanding of what we would expect at, uh, at each of the design uh, gateways. Um, and it can be challenging, of course, um, asking for information that is it's not possible to get. But if from a cost perspective, there's a it's a risk area. And then what we'd like to define here is we break down each of these building components into elements and try to define what what elements will be taken from the model and what elements will be manually measured just so it's clear, it's clear for the design team. It's clear for us what we ex what we expect, but for the design team and have it within the matrix document, it becomes important so that we can see that at this, we, we will be taking these elements from the model because they're not are from the 2D drawings because they're not going to be modeled. We should know that at the very beginning to set expectations, especially if it differs from industry norms. And then defining at the different design stages, when we will have this level of information so we can uh, extract from the from the uh, uh, the models. A little bit different to the LOD. The level of detail could be there, but the level of information might not, meaning that you might get a geometry output in quantum, but you might not get the, the information behind the building component or building element. Um, so it's important to de define this with the design team. It's more for them than you as a quantity surveyor, but nevertheless, uh, it's good. it's a good communication tool. And I would say at the different stages, you can you can see how we develop uh, some of the elements here in terms of what we would expect under services, si sizes, widths, heights, et cetera, along the project uh, as the, the systems are being developed. The reason that we try to uh, identify these in the BIM execution plan is so that the designers understand what, what our expectations are, as I mentioned. And so we have something then to be able to manage that information quality with the designers through the project lifecycle. And this means that it's not waiting to the very end of the, the project uh, or the, the stage or the gateway uh, to receive the models and then process them. It's actually sitting with the design teams on a weekly, fortnightly, a monthly basis, depending on what stage the project's at and having the conversation around the BIM execution plan. Is that what, is this is what we're doing, as we said we would do as per the BIM execution plan? Can we test some of the information coming from the models to make sure that, for example, the services has a system type, that the service has the, the right dimension structure, that the, it's been allocated to the right location within, within Revit or whatever platform or software that they're using? Um, and again, more kind of aspects here, questions to be asked, I guess, more than anything, you know, do the drawings have the right tags? Um, traditionally, uh, building components like walls and doors and floors will have tagging on drawing, but those those tags are different to the your, your new modeling reference. And so there needs to be some type of link between the tags on the drawings versus the information in the model. Often this is done through a key within the model so that when we export as QSs that we can we can understand exactly what we're looking at when we open a drawing or versus when we open a model. This is this is challenging sometimes um because the designers don't understand really that often you might have the modeler doing one element and then they might have a CAD technician putting on additional information on the drawings and suddenly they don't say, they're not saying the same thing. It becomes a challenge, you know. Um, cut lint uh, versus model lint um, uh, within, the, within the, the 3D models. Again, this comes back to the modeling rule versus a measurement rule. We need to understand how they model in the models so that when we extract this information, we're getting what we need. Um, and this this can be a huge error. We had it many years ago where we were extracting quantities for steel, not understanding uh, the difference between the cut lint and model lint, and it was throwing out 20, 25% difference over the entire steel in terms of linear meter of beams and columns, et cetera, and affecting your total quantum. So it becomes super challenging. So just some kind of quick information to know what to look at. And in external versus internal, you know, is that covered within your, your your definition and your coding structures um, and 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 how is that visible within the design information 
especially if you have soffits externally versus ceilings internally. Um, often you might find that, it, that the designers met, design it all as, as just ceilings and, and don't define soffits externally versus internal ceilings. And then the underground installations, and as we measure, mentioned before, the, the client uh, delivery. I use this diagram in every presentation I do. It's it's about collaboration, 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 collaboration. So between the cost manager and quantity surveyor, the modeler, and remember that modeler, there might be a modeler for architecture, there might be a modeler for services, there might be a different modeler for construction, there might be different discipline leads. We need to communicate with all of them and it becomes super important so that what we're delivering is, is, is a top quality design and information within that design. That's all defined with the BIM execution plan. And then kind of the last elements here that we'll run through um, is our quality control. Why is quality our responsibility, Ross? You would ask me what I would say that in order for us as QSs to become more efficient and more accurate in, in terms of what we do, we need to be able to use information produced by other stakeholders to automate a lot of what we do, especially the traditional manual measurement that takes a lot of time. Um, if we can take that time out by automation and look at quality control will improve the project for, for the client, for the employer, for all the other stakeholders. Because if we can quality assure quality control the information and we can process it as quantity surveyors, then that means the contractor can process the exact same information because we've already checked it. It means the design, the supply chain underneath the contractor can process that information. So by us qualifying it, we give good quality information to so many other um, stakeholders. This is where the efficiency really pays off, I would say, in, in terms of the, uh, the using the 3D model and the information and managing that quality of information, all from the BIM execution plan. So some quick checks, uh, you know, as we mentioned before, uh, checking uh, your uh, total area ceilings from the model versus your GFA, how does that look? Total area slabs, total area floor finishes, et cetera, et cetera. Those quick checks from a manual perspective to what you're getting as a result from the, 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 the model, the quantity outtake from the model will give you a good overview of, of, of the quality of, of those areas. Um, I won't spend too much time. All of these, this presentation material will be available. And all of this comes from the BIM execution plan, as I mentioned, but we're going in quality control should be part of your BIM execution plan. And as I mentioned, the appendix could uh, uh, include a quality control plan like this so that, that your QS is on site, can use it, but also that the, con the, 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 the employer, the client knows exactly what we're looking for and the design teams know what's important to us. So scope gaps. Duplication, as we mentioned before, is there elements in the model like double foundations that, that are hidden there, but they're there. So when you take out your quantities, you have challenges with it. Um, I'm just going to pick a, a couple of a couple of these uh, items. Is there enough in descriptive information in the model so that you can perhaps automate your text in your cost plan and your, your bill of quantities? That would be something really to consider when you're speaking to the design team so that you're not having to retype specification information or building component information, et cetera. Um, descriptions and associated quantities are elements correctly named in the description. You know, is the foundation correctly named? Has it got the correct tagging, the correct naming convention, et cetera? Uh, are the dimensions correctly named? Um, all of this is, is will become important in terms of that information quality. But where we want to get to is we want to do less typing and copying text from specifications uh, we want to be able to take it directly from the model, ideally, um, so that we get this level of, of, of automation. Uh, the level of detail, as I mentioned before, uh, where are we in relation to the stage of the project? Uh, have we tested and understood the level, the LOD uh, and, the, and the LOI level of information uh, at this stage? Has the design team delivered in accordance with those requirements in the BIM execution plan? Are we all happy enough with, with where we are in terms of being able to process that information as from a quantity surveyor's uh, perspective. And then, yes, data missing and, and altered through uh, transmission. What do we mean by that? So exporting information in IFC format means that maybe you lose some information. So you need to qu quality check that information extract. Um, the IFC format, uh, I think we, we will explain that later in the BIM bytes. 
um, in terms of open open BIM and and data sharing. It's a very important uh, file type. But um, as QSs, we do not need all the information that is in a rivet model because it's massive. Um, we need that information cut down. And ideally, we're defining that what information is necessary for us as QSs in the BIM execution plan so that we can see that this information is of, of priority, but all the standard re Revit information is not priority for us. So don't include that in the IFC export. Um, that will reduce the, the, the size of the files and it'll improve your processing time uh, within your, your platforms. So important to identify that in the, uh, in the BIM execution plan for sure. And um, again, I'll just to pick a few, I won't go down through all of these. Uh, you guys can read it later once you receive the presentations. Um, yes, are the drawings properly scaled? Well, that's an, that's an old one, isn't it? Uh, that has been a problem forever, uh, I would say. And the information on the drawings, is it properly are, are they properly tagged? And are the codes correct? Again, that's an old uh, kind of traditional uh, quality check anyway from a QS perspective, I would say. And the visual checks, um, you know, it, it's also important to look at the models and and whether it's Celebri or it's Costex or it's it's Revit itself that you, that you use as a QS. It's important to have a check in the models uh, when when working through and processing the the information and the data, um, just for yourself so you understand what it is that we're kind of looking at and see does is there anything the outlier there that doesn't make sense, you know, um, different layers on a roof or or issues in the substructure etc. But so today's presentation really on, on the BIM execution plan and really what the purpose of the BIM execution plan is, it's not just for design. It really is for a, a, an important tool for us as QSs uh, to manage the information flow and to come to an agreement before the project ever begins about what the expectation levels are. And of course, as I mentioned, the BIM execution plan and BIM in general is forcing more and more collaboration between the stakeholders. It's not a case where, where we're sitting waiting for information to be delivered. We really need to be involved in that, in that conversation from the very, very beginning. But um, that's all I have for you guys today. Um, like the last day, if you have your phones ready there, just uh, open up your camera. You can uh, uh, scan the QR code there. Uh, my contact details are uh, are there. We, we, we talk a lot about this on LinkedIn and, of course, with the SCSI as well um, in order to for us to, as a, an entire discipline, um, to 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 now be able to transition from our traditional uh, processes into more more digital, it's important that we we all come together at this at, at the same same level. But I'll open the floor, James. Uh, maybe is it yourself uh, that is uh, having a look there? Any questions? Uh, we we'll, we have a few minutes left, so yeah. I think uh, maybe we can we can have a few. If... Yeah, a few a few questions in the chat. Um, first of all, thanks for a great presentation as always, Ross. Um, so just read out a few of the questions from the chat here. Ross, does the does the BEP have contractual significance? So, i.e., does it um does it stem from one of the contract documents? I would say that it it should have contractual uh requirements. It wouldn't stem from it, but it it, it should because why do I say that? The reason being is that. The agreement between, for example, the employer, the client, and the design team, the design team will have certain requirements where they need to deliver within. The BIM execution plan should be part of that, that delivery requirement. So I would say that, yes, it should be contractual. And likewise, uh, every stakeholder at one point or another will be delivering uh, digital information, whether it is, for example, the quantity surveyor delivering you know, uh, uh, their cost plans and estimates in, in, in traditional PDF format, or we're sharing our costex or qubit files with the client because the client has the platforms and systems. So every stakeholder will now have a requirement to deliver within the BIM execution plan. And that should absolutely be contractual, uh, I would say. And, and who typically would prepare that plan, Ross? Would that be the architect or lead consultant or, or other? Yeah, it and it differs from project to project. I would say that the lead consultant is is are leading the process of developing the BIM execution plan, but everybody needs to be involved, as we mentioned, within that within that process because it affects everybody. So if the lead consultant is in charge of managing and developing the BIM execution plan, the QS for sure should be there giving uh, their opinion as well as the 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 design teams and other consultants and 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 again when the contractor comes on board there's another session with the BIM execution plan to make sure that the contractor understands how uh, how they should be delivering their information and data it could be 
that the QS manages the contract perhaps, because again, we are one of the disciplines that really uh, dives into the information and information quality. So it could be the quantity surveyor that, that could lead it. We have done so on, on, on a number of our jobs. Yeah, just a question on, on file names then. What's the most up-to-date name or reference for the BIM file? Is it D, DWXF or something else? I, I would always say IFC, IFC, DWXF, DWG. Uh, I would say IFC because it's an open source communication. Uh, and so in the BIM execution plan, often you will see that the engineers might use Tecla and the architect might use Revit. And one of the other architect like landscaping will use another platform. They need to be able to communicate horizontally across uh, with each other. And IFC is the best form of communication. So I would argue that it should be IFC. Yeah, and you mentioned a few um, a few different software types during the presentation. So yep. in terms of those, um, which software measurement package, probably it's probably going to depend case by case, but in your view, has the greatest scope for the QS in establishing very accurate quantities? So very accurate quantities doesn't come from the software package. It comes from the quality of the information. So it depends on how involved in the process of design you are as a QS. As we mentioned before, it's important that you you sit with the, the, the modelers for the different uh, uh, stakeholders and each week discuss, you know, uh, quality of information structure. Are we getting the right information? Is it is it called the right thing? Is it in, is it in the right location in terms of family type, uh, subtype, uh, instance, and so on? By doing that, I would say you'll get better quality quantities. From our perspective, we've looked at a lot of softwares. We currently use Costex, but that's because we've been using it since the beginning. Is it any better or any worse than any other platforms? Ah, it's all subjective in 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 my view. Um, but what you should look out for in the future is is cost and carbon. Um, uh, carbon coming now down the road very very quickly. Uh, we will need you will need to be using a, a software that does both cost and carbon. Um, if you want to become efficient at this, otherwise you'll end up having two different softwares, one for carbon, one for cost, and it'll become challenging for you as a as a practice in the future. That's just yeah. our opinion. Yeah, I suppose slightly related to that, and you've mentioned it as well in. Um... In, in your presentation, we'll be talking about it again, I'm sure, as well as ICMS. Yeah. Um, so, you know, do, do or, or will BIM designers design their models based on standards such as the NSBE or using the ICMS format? Um, I might mention there that we do, we have recently published a, a mapping document that maps the yeah. NSBE to ICMS. So I'll pop that into the chat, um, but I, I'll let you answer that while I go search for that document. This is a this is always a question everybody asks. Um, you know, how automated can we get when it comes to information from the models? Uh, some people believe uh, the theory is is that ideally speaking, the designers should be uh, classifying the models for a cost and uh, output. I disagree with that uh, because what we're doing is we're giving the responsibility to the designers uh, for our uh, uh, processing and our information quality. Um, I always like the idea that we use a standard classification like uh, Uniclass or what we have in Denmark, BIM 7AA, and then we map to our cost breakdown structure, which could be, you know, ICMS. It could be the National Building Standards. I believe in time it'll just be ICMS. But um, and underneath that you have your measurement rule, which uh, is either ARM5 obviously for the Irish market or NRM2 for the UK. But to answer your question, I I I don't see us implementing ICMS standards in the BIM execution plan for the architects to input in their models. I also think that we should not be interfering with the architects and engineers' models. We should only deal in IFC format. And I know different people have different opinions on this, but from, from our perspective, uh, the controller of the information, the responsibility, re responsible stakeholder is the architect and engineer for their design information. We're only processing it. We're only taking that information, restructuring it in our format, ICMS, National Building Standards, what have you, and for our output. But the center focal point of information and responsibility is with the design team, I would say. Right. I think we just have one more question before we wrap up, if that's okay. Um, could you just explain the difference between LOD and LOI? Yeah, so the level of, of detail uh, often relates to geometry. So when you look at an LO, let's just say LOD 100 uh, for a steel column, 
and you take a, a, a plan view of that, a section of it, and you look down, generally all you'll see is a box. If you go to LOD 350, you'll actually get the geometry of the, the steel column, including information associated with that column. So when we talk about, and that's the difference between LOD. So you go from a, just a box placeholder to quite a lot of detail when it comes to the, uh, the geometry. The LOI is the information associated with that building component. So for example, the LOD might define that you need to you need to say if this is a column, if it's steel, what have you. But the LOI requirements might go further. You might have to state within the the 3D model the fire the fire requirements for that steel, what the finish of coating would be for on that steel, etc. So you're adding another layer of information to the building component within the model. When I say you, I mean the design team are because that's what the beam execution plan has defined and that's what the the, the project has defined. So. From our perspective as QSs, not only do we take geometry, you know, linear meter, kgs, cubic meter, whatever from the model, we're also taking the additional information from the model as well. So what we're trying to do is automate the, the cost plan text uh, at each building component by extracting that level of information from the model and then putting the quantum beside it, rather than sitting there having to retype what the designer has already done within Rivet column size, column function, whatever the case may be. So that level of information becomes key. Um, and up to date, I would say that we're delivering models for two purposes to date. One is clash detection and the other is drawing production. So the LOD kind of requirement we understand because we can get our drawings from it and we can get clash detection from it. The next layer is the LOI, the information. If we can, if we can layer the information onto the LOD to a good quality, now we can process that to understand uh, what that information is telling us from a QS, uh, health and safety, a sustainability uh, perspective. So LOI, in our opinion, is much more valuable than LOD, I would say. But um, yeah, that's an open debate. I think we have we have time for just one more question if anyone wants to pop something in the chat. But just before that, I just mentioned that um, for all the participants in the coming next day or two, you will get an email from SESI with login details to the SESI online learning management system. We're going to house all recordings in there um, and we'll also pop in there some of the documents um, that, that we mentioned today and that we'll be mentioning throughout the program. So the likes of the, the NSB to ICMS mapping document I mentioned there um, and some others as well. So we'll, we'll pop all those online for you to, to access. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't know if I, I don't see any other questions in the chat or if anyone wants to raise a hand or raise anything. We'll be, we'll be back on Friday if, um, if anything occurs in the meantime. And Fridays, uh, as I mentioned before, we're focusing on ISO 19650 and some of the standards that are available to us from a, a QS perspective. Right, so as we're Super. pretty much bang on the air, um, lots of thanks for a great presentation comments coming in, Ross, um, as, as well, always. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks to all of our participants for joining us as well.